Chapter Seventeen, Part Two of *The Girl on the Boat* by P. G. Woodhouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Three. In the moment which elapsed before either of the two could calm their agitated brains to speech, Eustace became aware, as never before, of the truth of that well-known line: "Peace, perfect peace, with loved ones far away." There was certainly little hope of peace with loved ones in his bedroom. Dully he realized that in a few minutes Jane Hubbard would be returning with her book, but his imagination refused to envisage the scene which would then occur. Eustace, Mrs. Hignett gasped, hand on heart. Eustace, for the first time, Mrs. Hignett seemed to become aware that it was a changed face that confronted hers. Good gracious! How stout you've grown! It's mumps. Mumps? Yes, I've got mumps. Mrs. Hignett's mind was too fully occupied with other matters to allow her to dwell on this subject. Eustace, there are men in the house. This fact was just what Eustace had been wondering how to break to her. I know, he said uneasily. You know? Mrs. Hignett stared. Did you hear them? Hear them? Said Eustace, puzzled. The drawing room window was left open, and there are two burglars in the hall. Oh, I say, no, that's rather rotten," said Eustace. "I saw them and heard them. I, oh!" Mrs. Hignett's sentence trailed off into a suppressed shriek as the door opened and Jane Hubbard came in. Jane Hubbard was a girl who, by nature and training, was well adapted to bear shocks. Her guiding motto in life was that helpful line of Horace. Aequam memento rebus in arduis sevare mentem. For the benefit of those who have not, like myself, enjoyed an expensive classical education, memento, take my tip, servare, preserve, aequam, an unruffled, mentem, mind, rebus in arduis, in every crisis. She had only been out of the room a few minutes, and in that brief period, a middle-aged lady of commanding aspect had apparently come up through a trap. It would have been enough to upset most girls, but Jane Hubbard bore it calmly. All through her vivid life, her bedroom had been a sort of cosy corner for murderers, alligators, tarantulas, scorpions, and every variety of snake. So she accepted the middle-aged lady without comment. Good evening," she said placidly. Mrs. Hignett, having rallied from her moment of weakness, glared at the new arrival dumbly. She could not place Jane. From the airy way in which she had strolled into the room, she appeared to be some sort of a nurse, but she wore no nurse's uniform. "Who are you?" she asked stiffly. "Who are you?" asked Jane. "I," said Mrs. Hignett portentously, "am the owner of this house, and I should be glad to know what you are doing in it." I am Mrs. Horace Hignett. A charming smile spread itself over Jane's finely cut face. "I'm so glad to meet you," she said. "I have heard so much about you." "Indeed," said Mrs. Hignett coldly. "And now I should like to hear a little about you." "I've read all your books," said Jane. "I think they're wonderful." In spite of herself. In spite of a feeling that this young woman was straying from the point, Mrs. Hignett could not check a slight influx of amiability. She was an authoress who received a good deal of incense from admirers, but she could always do with a bit more. Besides, most of the incense came by post. Living a quiet and retired life in the country, it was rarely that she got it handed to her face to face. She melted quite perceptibly. She did not cease to look like a basilisk. But she began to look like a basilisk who has had a good lunch. My favorite said Jane, who for a week had been sitting daily in a chair in the drawing room adjoining the table on which the authoress's complete works were assembled, is the spreading light. I do like the spreading light. It was written some years ago, said Mrs. Hignett, with something approaching cordiality. And I have since revised some of the views I state in it, but I still consider it quite a good textbook. Of course, I can see that what of the morrow is more profound," said Jane. "But I read the spreading light first, and of course that makes a difference. 
"'I can quite see that it would,' agreed Mrs. Hignett. "'One's first step across the threshold of a new mind, one's first glimpse. "'Yes, it makes you feel—' "'Like some watcher of the skies,' said Mrs. Hignett, "'when a new planet swims into his ken, or like—' "'Yes, doesn't it?' said Jane. "'Eustace, who had been listening to the conversation with every muscle tense, "'in much the same mental attitude as that of a peaceful citizen in a Wild West saloon, "'who holds himself in readiness to dive under a table directly the shooting begins, "'began to relax. "'What he had shrinkingly anticipated would be the biggest thing since the Dempsey-Carpentier fight "'seemed to be turning into a pleasant social and literary evening, "'not unlike, he imagined, a meeting of old Girton students must be.' For the first time since his mother had come into the room, he indulged in the luxury of a deep breath. "'But what are you doing here?' asked Mrs. Hignett, returning almost reluctantly to the main issue. Eustace perceived that he had breathed too soon. In an unobtrusive way he subsided into the bed, and softly pulled the sheets over his head, following the excellent tactics of the great Duke of Wellington in his peninsular campaign." "'When in doubt,' the Duke used to say, "'retire and dig yourself in.' "'I'm nursing dear Eustace,' said Jane. Mrs. Hignett quivered and cast an eye on the hump in the bedclothes, which represented dear Eustace. A cold fear had come upon her. "'Dear Eustace,' she repeated mechanically. "'We're engaged,' said Jane. "'Engaged? Eustace, is this true?' "'Yes,' said a muffled voice from the interior of the bed. "'And poor Eustace is so worried,' continued Jane, "'about the house,' she went on quickly. "'He doesn't want to deprive you of it, "'because he knows what it means to you. "'So he is hoping, we are both hoping, "'that you will accept it as a present when we are married. "'We really shan't want it, you know. "'We are going to live in London. "'So you will take it, won't you, to please us?' "'We all of us.' Even the greatest of us have our moments of weakness. Only a short while back, in this very room, we have seen Jane Hubbard, that indomitable girl, sobbing brokenly on the carpet. Let us then not express any surprise at the sudden collapse of one of the world's greatest female thinkers. As the meaning of this speech smote on Mrs. Horace Hignett's understanding, she sank weeping into a chair. The ever-present fear that had haunted her had been exercised. Windles was hers in perpetuity. The relief was too great. She sat in her chair and gulped, and Eustace, greatly encouraged, emerged slowly from the bedclothes, like a worm after a thunderstorm. How long this poignant scene would have lasted one cannot say. It is a pity that it was cut short, for I should have liked to dwell upon it. But at this moment, from the regions downstairs, there suddenly burst upon the silent night such a whirlwind of sound as effectually dissipated the tense emotion in the room. Somebody appeared to have touched off the orchestrion in the drawing-room, and that willing instrument had begun again in the middle of a bar at the point where Jane Hubbard had switched it off four afternoons ago. Its wailing lament for the passing of summer filled the whole house. "'That's too bad,' said Jane." a little annoyed, at this time of night. "'It's the burglars,' quavered Mrs. Hignett. In the stress of recent events, she had completely forgotten the existence of those enemies of society. "'They were dancing in the hall when I arrived, and now they're playing the orchestrion.' "'Light-hearted chaps,' said Eustace, admiring the saint foix of the criminal world. "'Full of spirits,' "'This won't do,' said Jane Hubbard, shaking her head. "'We can't have this sort of thing. "'I'll go and fetch my gun.' "'They'll murder you, dear,' panted Mrs. Hignett, clinging to her arm. Jane Hubbard laughed. "'Murder me?' she said amusedly. "'I'd like to catch them at it.' Mrs. Hignett stood staring at the door as Jane closed it softly behind her. "'Eustace,' she said solemnly, "'that is a wonderful girl.' "'Yes. She once killed a panther, or a puma, I forget which, with a hat-pin,' said Eustace, with enthusiasm. "'I could wish you no better wife,' said Mrs. Hignett. She broke off with a sharp wail. Out in the passage something like a battery of artillery had roared. 
The door opened, and Jane Hubbard appeared, slipping a fresh cartridge into the elephant gun. "'One of them was popping about outside here,' she announced. "'I took a shot at him, but I'm afraid I missed. The visibility was bad. At any rate, he went away.' In this last statement she was perfectly accurate. Bree Mortimer, who had been aroused by the orchestrion, and who had come out to see what was the matter, had gone away at the rate of fifty miles an hour. He had been creeping down the passage when he found himself suddenly confronted by a dim figure which, without a word, had attempted to slay him with an enormous gun. The shot had whistled past his ears and gone singing down the corridor. This was enough for Bream. He had returned to his room in three strides, and was now under the bed. The burglars might take everything in the house and welcome, so that they did not molest his privacy. That was the way Bream looked at it, and very sensible of him, too, I consider. "'We'd better go downstairs,' said Jane. "'Bring the candle. Not you, Eustace, darling. You stay where you are, or you may catch a chill. Don't stir out of bed.' "'I won't,' said Eustace obediently." Four. Of all the leisured pursuits there are few less attractive to the thinking man than sitting in a dark cupboard waiting for a house-party to go to bed, and Sam, who had established himself in the one behind the piano at a quarter to eight, soon began to feel as if he had been there for an eternity. He could dimly remember a previous existence in which he had not been sitting in his present position, but it seemed so long ago that it was shadowy and unreal to him. The ordeal of spending the evening in this retreat had not appeared formidable when he had contemplated it that afternoon in the lane, but now that he was actually undergoing it, it was extraordinary how many disadvantages it had. Cupboards, as a class, are badly ventilated, and this one seemed to contain no air at all, and the warmth of the night, combined with the cupboard's natural stuffiness, had soon begun to reduce Sam to a condition of pulp. He seemed to himself to be sagging like an ice-cream in front of a fire. The darkness, too, weighed upon him. He was abominably thirsty. Also, he wanted to smoke. In addition to this, the small of his back tickled, and he more than suspected the cupboard of harbouring mice. Not once or twice, but many hundred times, he wished that the ingenious Webster had thought of something simpler. His was a position which would just have suited one of those Indian mystics who sit perfectly still for twenty years, contemplating the infinite, but it reduced Sam to an almost imbecile state of boredom. He tried counting sheep. He tried going over his past life in his mind from the earliest moment he could recollect, and thought he had never encountered a duller series of episodes. He found a temporary solace by playing a succession of mental golf games over all the courses he could remember, and he was just teeing up for the 16th at Muirfield, after playing Hoylake, St. Andrews, Westward Ho, Hangar Hill, Mid-Surrey, Walton Heath, and Sandwich, when the light ceased to shine through the crack under the door, and he awoke with a sense of dull incredulity to the realization that the occupants of the drawing-room had called it a day, and that his vigil was over." But was it? Once more alert, Sam became cautious. True, the light seemed to be off, but did that mean anything in a country house where people had the habit of going and strolling about the garden to all hours? Probably they were still popping about all over the place. At any rate, it was not worth risking coming out of his lair. He remembered that Webster had promised to come and knock an all-clear signal on the door. It would be safer to wait for that." But the moments went by, and there was no knock. Sam began to grow impatient. The last few minutes of waiting in a cupboard are always the hardest. Time seemed to stretch out again interminably. Once he thought he heard footsteps, but they led to nothing. Eventually, having strained his ears and finding everything still, he decided to take a chance. He fished in his pocket for the key, cautiously unlocked the door, opened it by slow inches, and peered out. The room was in blackness. The house was still. All was well. With the feeling of a life-prisoner emerging from the Bastille, he began to crawl stiffly forward, and it was just then that the first of the disturbing events occurred which were to make this night memorable to him. Something like a rattlesnake suddenly went off with a horror, and his head, jerking up, collided with the piano. 
It was only the cuckoo clock, which now, having cleared its throat, as was its custom before striking, proceeded to cook eleven times in rapid succession before subsiding with another rattle, but to Sam it sounded like the end of the world. He sat in the darkness, massaging his bruised skull. His hours of imprisonment in the cupboard had had a bad effect on his nervous system, and he vacillated between tears of weakness and a militant desire to get at the cuckoo clock with a hatchet. He felt that it had done it on purpose, and was now chuckling to itself in fancied security. For quite a minute he raged silently, and any cuckoo clock which had strayed within his reach would have had a bad time of it. Then his attention was diverted. So concentrated was Sam on his private vendetta with the clock, that no ordinary happening would have had the power to distract him. What occurred now was by no means ordinary, and it distracted him like an electric shock. As he sat on the floor, passing a tender hand over the egg-shaped bump which had already begun to manifest itself beneath his hair, something cold and wet touched his face, and paralyzed him so completely, both physically and mentally, that he did not move a muscle, but just congealed where he sat into a solid block of ice. He felt vaguely that this was the end. His heart had stopped beating, and he simply could not imagine it ever starting again, and, if your heart refuses to beat, what hope is there for you? At this moment something heavy and solid struck him squarely in the chest, rolling him over. Something gurgled asthmatically in the darkness. Something began to lick his eyes, ears, and chin in a sort of ecstasy, and, clutching out, he found his arms full of totally unexpected bulldog. "'Get out!' whispered Sam tensely, recovering his faculties with a jerk. "'Go away!' Smith took the opportunity of Sam's lips having opened to lick the roof of his mouth. Smith's attitude in the matter was that Providence, in its all-seeing wisdom, had sent him a human being, at a moment when he had reluctantly been compelled to reconcile himself to a total absence of such indispensable adjuncts to a good time. He had just trotted downstairs, in rather a disconsolate frame of mind, after waiting with no result in front of Webster's bedroom door, and it was a real treat to him to meet a man, especially one seated in such a jolly and sociable manner on the floor. He welcomed Sam like a long-lost friend. Between Smith and the humans who provided him with dog-biscuits, and occasionally with sweet-cakes, there had always existed a state of misunderstanding which no words could remove. The position of the humans was quite clear. They had elected Smith to his present position on a straight watchdog ticket. They expected him to be one of those dogs who rouse the house and save the spoons. They looked to him to pin burglars by the leg and hold on till the police arrived. Smith simply could not grasp such an attitude of mind. He regarded Windles not as a private house, but as a social club, and was utterly unable to see any difference between the human beings he knew and the strangers who dropped in for a late chat after the place was locked up. He had no intention of biting Sam— the idea never entered his head. At the present moment, what he felt about Sam was that he was one of the best fellows he had ever met, and that he loved him like a brother. Sam, in his unnerved state, could not bring himself to share these amiable sentiments. He was thinking bitterly that Webster might have had the intelligence to warn him of bulldogs on the premises. It was just the sort of woolen-headed thing fellows did, forgetting facts like that. He scrambled stiffly to his feet, and tried to pierce the darkness that hemmed him in. He ignored Smith, who snuffled sportively about his ankles, and made for the slightly less black oblong which he took to be the door leading into the hall. He moved warily, but not warily enough to prevent his cannoning into, and almost upsetting, a small table with a vase on it. The table rocked, and the vase jumped— and the first bit of luck that had come to Sam that night was when he reached out at a venture and caught it just as it was about to bound on to the carpet. He stood there shaking. The narrowness of the escape turned him cold. If he had been an instant later, there would have been a crash loud enough to wake a dozen sleeping houses. This sort of thing could not go on. He must have light. It might be a risk— there might be a chance of somebody upstairs seeing it and coming down to investigate, but it was a risk that must be taken. He declined to go on stumbling about in this darkness any longer. He groped his way with infinite care to the door, 
on the wall adjoining which, he presumed, the electric light switch would be. It was nearly ten years since he had last been inside Windles, and it never occurred to him that in this progressive age even a woman like his Aunt Adeline, of whom he could believe almost anything, would still be using candles and oil lamps as a means of illumination. His only doubt was whether the switch was where it was, in most houses, near the door. It is odd to reflect that, as his searching fingers touched the knob, a delicious feeling of relief came to Samuel Marlowe. This misguided young man actually felt at that moment that his troubles were over. He positively smiled as he placed a thumb on the knob, and shoved. He shoved strongly and sharply, and instantaneously there leaped at him out of the darkness a blare of music, which appeared to his disordered mind quite solid. It seemed to wrap itself round him. It was all over the place. In a single instant the world had become one vast bellow of Tosti's good-bye. How long he stood there, frozen, he did not know, nor can one say how long he would have stood there had nothing further come to invite his notice elsewhere. But suddenly, drowning even the impromptu concert, there came from somewhere upstairs the roar of a gun, and when he heard that, Sam's rigid limbs relaxed, and a violent activity descended upon him. He bounded out into the hall, looking to right and to left for a hiding place. One of the suits of armor which had been familiar to him in his boyhood loomed up in front of him, and with the sight came the recollection of how, when a mere child on his first visit to Windles, playing hide-and-seek with his cousin Eustace, he had concealed himself inside this very suit, and had not only baffled Eustace through a long summer evening, but had wound up by almost scaring him into a decline by booing at him through the visor of the helmet. Happy days, happy days! He leaped at the suit of armor. Having grown since he was last inside it, he found the helmet a tight fit, but he managed to get his head into it at last, and the body of the thing was quite roomy. "'Thank heaven!' said Sam. He was not comfortable, but comfort just then was not his primary need. Smith, the bulldog, well satisfied with the way the entertainment had opened, sat down, wheezing slightly, to await developments." End of chapter 17, part 2, read by Kara Schallenberg in September 2011 in San Diego, California.